Hey, I'm Birskut, and in this video we're gonna take the third person character controller from my previous video and make it multiplayer. If you didn't watch that video, I recommend you do that now. We'll start from where we left off. Hit Alt M or Option M to open the marketplace and we'll install Rogue Croquet. This package is an officially supported integration of Croquet, a platform that allows you to create multiplayer games without the need for a server. It works by synchronizing clients through the multi-sync reflector network. This is, naturally, way more affordable and convenient than writing and running servers. So we'll go to croquet.io and sign up to get an API key and an app ID. Now, as it's explained here in the GitHub readme, we need to create a JSON file with this structure in the static folder of our project. So we'll go ahead and create the croquet.json file. Paste the code and replace these fields with your actual app ID and API key. Now we'll head back to the editor. Select the scene object and we're going to add the croquet config component. This will basically start a multiplayer session when we play the scene. For the purpose of this video, we're just going to add everyone to the main session. I'll drag it to the top to make sure it has priority over the physics. I will set the app name to test v1. Changing the name will give you a fresh new main session. Now for every player that joins, we need to instantiate a player character like this one. The way we do this is by creating a prefab that will represent what we'll call the actor. I know it sounds a bit obscure right now, but it'll be super clear later so make sure you stick all the way to the end. And don't forget to hit the like and subscribe while you're at it. Currently, our player is controlled by the kinematic character controller. This is excellent to control it locally, but when it's representing a remote player, we need to freely set its transform without the restrictions of the controller. So to make this very simple, we'll add a rapier body, set its type to fixed, and drag it all the way to the top. Then we'll disable the rapier kinematic character controller and the rapier third person controller. So if it's us controlling the player, we'll remove the rapier body and enable these two. Next we'll drag and drop our object into the icon view to create a prefab. And there it is. Now we can delete the instance from our scene. Next we'll create a component and call it game logic. Go ahead and open it in VS Code. We need to start by creating a model for our component. We do this by giving the model decorator to a class which we'll name exactly like the component, but adding the word model in front and extending the base model class. This is what Croquet actually synchronizes between clients internally. Models need to be identical. If a bad actor modifies the model, they just won't be joining the party. The component itself needs to extend from Croquet view as it will act as the view providing the representation of whatever the model is synchronizing. In this case, we'll also need to set the aesthetic model property to true in both the model and view to tell the root model that we only want a single instance of this one. Keep in mind that each player will recreate the session locally, so this is the way we ensure that they don't create duplicates. Now, GameLogic will be in charge of spawning our players so we'll add an array of spawn points and a select spawn point method, which will select a random element from our list. We'll use this later in the player model to set the initial position. Now it's time for the view, but first we'll need to import the rapier body, the rapier kinematic character controller and the rapier third person controller in order to set up our player. Next we'll add the prefab field for our player and we'll use the init method. This will execute when the game logic model is initialized. Inside, we'll instantiate our player prefab, and as we planned earlier, we'll remove the rapier body component and enable the rapier kinematic character controller and the rapier third person controller. Now back in the editor, we'll select the scene object and add the game logic component. You can see that it has the prefab field we created, so we'll drop a third person character prefab there. Next, we need to take care of the player controller, so we'll open it in VS Code. Now, same as with the game logic, we need a model view pair. But since we are representing our players, instead of base model, we'll extend its subtype actor. And instead of croquet view, our component will extend its subtype croquet pawn. These have a special treatment by Rogue Croquet. Basically, when a player joins, the root model will look internally for all the actors in the session and spawn them for you. If you're using TypeScript like me, you'll need to set the type of the model property to player controller model. Now back in the editor, if you bring the player prefab back, you'll see that the player controller now has this spawn prefab field. This is the prefab that will be instantiated to represent other players. In our case, 
we'll be using the same prefab so go ahead and drop it there. Then we'll drop the prefab in the icon view again to save it and delete the instance from our scene. Now back into player controller, to synchronize our players, we'll use what I think is the best approach for most use cases, as it allows you to get started easily and scaling complexity when needed. We'll start by importing the game logic model and the 3JS library. Now the actor model will need to keep track if we're grounded or not, and also the transform, which will synchronize as an object containing the position, rotation and direction length of the input. Next we'll define the onInit method. This will be called when the model is initialized. Inside, we'll use the well-known model function to retrieve the game logic model and call the select spawn point method we defined earlier. We'll store the result in a variable and proceed to set the position vector in our transform from the selected array. Now it's time for the pawn. Here we'll define the position, rotation and direction length received from a remote player. We'll also create this convenient accessor to get the local direction length directly from the kinematic controller. We'll create another getter, in this case for the transform, we'll return an object with our local position, rotation and direction length. Same structure as in the model. We need to send this information to all players, so we'll give it the prop decorator from the player actor. This will create a link with the property of the same name in the model. We're also passing a number to set the update rate in milliseconds. In this case, 55 is plenty. Now we'll also need a setter for our transform. We'll copy the receive position, rotation and direction length in the properties we defined earlier. This is relevant when we're representing a remote player. But if it's our player, that is, if the is me property is true, we'll want to set the position of our kinematic controller directly using the set next kinematic translation method in its reshoot body. Now we'll use the private field to track the grounded status and same as before, we'll add a prop decorator to the is grounded getter, which if it's not us, will return the private field. Otherwise, it'll give us the value in the kinematic controller. In this case, the prop decorator is set to true because it only changes every so often. If we don't set it to true or a number, the bound property will only read the value from the model, but it won't be able to send updates. For the setter, we'll simply set the received value to the private field. We'll also define the init method here like we did in game logic. There we'll set the initial state of transform and is grounded directly from the model. Now in the update, if the actor model is not initialized, we need to return. We'll also use the is grounded property we created, and for the direction length, if it's our player, we'll use the local, otherwise the one received over the network. Now we need to actually send the updates and react to them. If this is our player, we'll check our is grounded state against the model, and if it's changed, we'll use the update prop method to send the update. Same with the position and rotation. We compare them to the model, and if one or both have changed, we'll send the update. Next, if this is not our player, we'll want to interpolate the local rotation quaternion towards the received one. And finally, we'll use the damp v3 method to interpolate the local position with the one we have received. Interpolation methods help to smooth out the movement, otherwise we'd see the other players teleporting. Now to test this, simply navigate to the address in the top right corner of the editor on any device within your network, in this case I'm using my phone. To play within the editor, make sure that the editor is the last one to enter the session, otherwise it will break, so keep that in mind. Now as it is, this is perfect for casual or co-op games, but I'll show you how to run an authoritative check to prevent players from moving more than they should. If you check out the kinematic character controller in our player, its speed is set to 5. This is how much it moves every frame before computing delta time. So in the player actor class, we'll define the move rate, which is the update rate of the transform, in our case 55, and the minimum ping we want to account for. I think 20 is plenty. Then we define the speed, in this case 5, and we multiply it by the move rate plus the ping to account for the whole round trip, and we divide it by 1000 to get the fraction of a second. Now we'll define the onBefore update prop method, which gets executed when our model receives a value and intends to update a given key. If you're updating the transform, we'll define our current position and new position, ignoring the y. Then we get the direction of the movement by subtracting them. Get the length of the result to see how much we moved. And if we moved more than the speed, we modify the value and return it to enforce it on both the model and the view. Now I'll set the speed to 4 and we can see it in action. Obviously each game is different and requires different levels of safety checks. 
How would you go about doing authoritative checks on jump and falling? Leave me a comment down there. But don't get too hung up on this. Focus on making an incredibly fun game first and foremost. Because the worst thing that could happen, and sadly the most common, is that nobody cares. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit the like button and let me know in the comments what kind of game would you like to make with this. I do care, so let me know. For a full example, you can check out the Robot Deathmatch game on GitHub. Alright, see you in the next one.